Postmodernists are famous for denying the existence of objective truth. Even if their claims are paradoxical, they say things like, the truth is that there is no truth. That doesn't seem to dissuade them. So does postmodernism come with a certain type of psychology? What do you do when you encounter contradiction? Is internal inconsistency really that big a deal? This is the topic I'm discussing on the 58th episode of Patterson in Pursuit. Hello, my friends and enemies, and soon to be enemies. Welcome to the 58th episode of Patterson in Pursuit. I could not be more excited about this episode. My guest this week is Dr. Stephen Hicks, who's making his second appearance on Patterson in Pursuit. Last time we spoke was September 2016, and we talked about the topic of postmodernism, the history, the ideas, and at the very end of our conversation, we brought up this really interesting question. What do you do when you encounter a contradiction? If you say things like, it is absolutely true that there is no absolute truth, you've just contradicted yourself. And then what? What do you do? For somebody like me, I go, oh, okay, well, I must have been wrong. But maybe for the postmodernists, they don't have this response. They say, okay, I contradict myself, no big deal. Maybe reality itself is contradictory. If you've gone to college or you've even interacted with professors or people have gone to college, no doubt you've encountered this worldview. People say, oh, well, everybody knows there's no such thing as truth. Everything's socially constructed. There's no such thing as objective reality. That's what the conversation is about with Dr. Stephen Hicks, who is a philosopher teaching at Rockford University. He is the director of the Center for Ethics and Entrepreneurship and is the author of Explaining Postmodernism, Skepticism from Rousseau to Foucault. The sponsor for this excellent episode is the excellent company, Praxis. Like I said, if you've been to a college campus or you've spoken with professors or students, you know that this worldview is popular. And the worldview also comes with a bunch of other really silly ideas like the only way you can succeed in the world is by spending four years of your life and over $100,000 getting taught by professors who've never engaged with the real world, who have ridiculous worldviews, and they'll teach you all the relevant information for how to be successful in life. And if you don't go to college, you will find success impossible and all your friends will laugh at you for being a silly nincompoop. Fortunately, just like there is a pushback on the worldview of postmodernism, there is also a pushback on this idea that college is essential for personal success. It's not. Praxis is an apprenticeship program where instead of spending $100,000 in four years of your life learning nonsense, you spend three months working through their professional boot camp where you learn real-world job skills and then immediately you get placed for six months at a paid apprenticeship. This is very much a no-nonsense approach to real-world education. Check it out, steve-patterson.com slash praxis, P-R-A-X-I-S. And before we start, I do want to give just a special shout-out to all the Patreon supporters at patreon.com slash stevepatterson. You guys have consistently valued the show. You value the work that I'm doing. We're constantly growing in numbers, and I deeply appreciate the support that you guys are showing. If you're listening to this and you also value the content that's being produced, head over to patreon.com slash Steve Patterson, and you can contribute just a dollar or two whenever a new episode is released. Plus, you get a bunch of awesome perks. You get access to a private Facebook group. You get a free copy of both the books that I've written and every book that I'll write in the future. Check it out. All right, that's enough for me. Let's go straight to the interview. So, Dr. Stephen Hicks, thank you very much for coming back on Patterson in Pursuit. It's a pleasure to have you again on the show. Ah, for me too. Uh, the last conversation we had was about eight months ago, and I want to pick up exactly where we left off. And my guess is that it's probably not the very last thing that you've listened to, so... I will, uh, I'll get everybody up to speed, the conversation that we had. And I want to say, too, that last conversation we had is one of the most popular podcasts uh, that I've released so far. Got a lot of good response. Everybody loved, everybody loved it. So uh, Good to hear. I've been looking forward to this follow-up for many months because um, we had this good conversation that was about postmodernism. And it was about the history and the ideas of postmodernism. And then we talked about... Um, the specifically and near the end of the conversation about how postmodernism runs into self-contradiction. It runs into paradoxes. 
uh, things like if I were to say, um, the truth is that there is no truth, or I know that we know nothing, or words mean nothing. All of these mm -hmm. things are self-contradictory. And sure. my position was, if a thinker is running into a self-contradiction, that is a demonstration that uh, the thinker is wrong in that particular way. And if the thinker runs into a self-contradiction and is okay with the contradiction, then they demonstrate that they aren't, aren't a particularly deep thinker and maybe that their ideas shouldn't even be respected. Mm -hmm. And you pushed back on that. You said, well, it depends on the psychology of the philosopher and the thinker. Some people I, react to uh, contradictions in different ways. Let me uh, yeah, jump in. You, you yes. said two things there. I pushed back on the second one. Right. Yeah, the first one that the person is wrong. Yeah, I, I agree right entirely. <laughs> so you need to do some uh, some work to uh, to show that mm -hmm. and explain why that is. Uh, the second one, yeah, we can uh, talk more about that. Yes, that's and we we brought that up. We had this dialogue, and then we both had to go. So it was right. like this perfect perfect segue. But that's exactly <laughs> where right. I, where I want to pick up. So my claim is still: if somebody contradicts themselves and they accept the contradiction. Right. They're probably not a deep thinker, but you disagree. Yep. Yeah, so that raises, uh, again, some deep questions, right, about, about the uh, the status of logic. And the point uh, I would make, we'll start with a, the general claim here, is that uh, people who are uh, very smart and deep thinkers can, when they're thinking about human cognition, which is an extraordinarily complicated process, uh, so to speak, logically and rationally argue themselves into various skeptical positions mm -hmm. that they probably will find uncomfortable right along the way. But as deep, thoughtful people uh, who engage with lots of uh, other deep, thoughtful people uh, come not to see how those conclusions, so to speak, are inescapable. And one of those conclusions can be right that uh, logic doesn't matter that much, right? Or it matters, but there are other things also that matter. Uh, and on the basis of that, one can deeply right, arrive at a conclusion where at some level you are comfortable with uh, living with contradiction or living mm -hmm. with at least logical tensions right, within uh, um, your thought to varying degrees. So do you think part of that is if you come to those um, beliefs that you're comfortable acknowledging, if we're playing devil's advocate here, um, that the beliefs are false? So are the would the people in this position be saying, yes, I contradict myself, but maybe contradictions are inescapable, and I recognize my claims are false? Uh, if you have a contradiction uh, and you uh, accept logic, then what you know at that point is one of the contradictory claims at least is false. Mm. But you would need to do more work to make the judgment call about which one it is. So you know that there's a falsehood in there somewhere. So if somebody is um, pursuing truth, let's say, and they're, they're making a positive claim about what is true, what is the case, and they're saying, well, in some circumstances, what is the case is not actually the case. And I contradict myself, and maybe that doesn't quite make sense, but I'm going to believe it anyway. Is there not? Uh, Go ahead. Right. Yeah, I think that is, that's possible, right, psychologically. So uh, if Also, at the tail, you know, you're, you're adding another element right at the tail end, which is you know, a, a decision about what your belief is going to be. Hmm given the uh, the awareness of at least a tension or an outright contradiction right in your in your belief mm -hmm. there's one thing that's possible right about belief is uh, you know, beliefs do come in degrees you can say well i'm going to you know say you know uh, this is likely and that's a different kind of cognitive set from saying this is highly likely mm -hmm. or is, you know, I'm, I'm convinced of this. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's also uh, possible that one uh, takes a belief in a provisional fashion, right? And so this can take one in a more 
uh, philosophically pragmatic right, direction. So you say, I believe it, right, but what, that doesn't necessarily mean that I'm making you know a lifetime commitment to this, but rather, given my current state of knowledge, right, including my awareness that my my uh, system has some tensions or contradictions within it, mm-hmm. given that I don't see a better alternative at this point, right, I'm going to uh, believe it, right. But what that means is that I'm going to uh, uh, use it as my dispositional set. I'm going to act on it, right, for now. Uh, until I you know, perhaps change my mind at some other point. Hmm. So that tail end about the the nature of the belief commitment that the person makes also needs to be teased out. Okay, so let's um, let's give a concrete example. Let's say uh, the excellent example of this is the liar's paradox. It comes up all the time when talking about logic and contradictions. Let's say that somebody is has there's a lot of tension in their mind when they think about this sentence is false. They think, well, it's true, it's false. Hmm. There's one um, psychological disposition which would say, you know what, I have a positive belief that it is true and false at the same time. It is true and it's not the case that it's true, but I'm still going to believe that. There's mm-hmm. another psychological disposition which says, well, if if I'm bumping into an explanation for the liar's paradox that implies what is true is not true, then it means I'm bumping into uh, an error on my end. That obviously, obviously, more work needs to be done to resolve something. Right. So we're not right. claiming that what is true is not true. Right. So in the case of a very a, a bald paradox or, uh, or a bold whatever metaphor is the right one there, <laughs> like the uh, like the liar's paradox, uh, where you know within the space of two or three or four propositions, you can hold all of those in your mind at one point and grasp right the contradiction there. Uh, If right at that point, one says what you said, uh, that I believe that this proposition is both true and false uh, simultaneously, or at least within the the time of my mental grasp here, yet then I think one is uh, psychologically disintegrating right at that point. (laughs) What do you mean by that? Well, I, I I don't think uh, that one is engaging in in cognition right at that point. Interesting. That, that yeah, that your 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 mental set right is uh, not relating in any way to reality, and is not communicating even to oneself uh, anything significant right or meaningful right. So hmm. the, the words, I think, stop being meaningful to you at that point, hmm. and you're not uh, actually engaging in cognition anymore. Interesting. Okay. I, I, that is, right, so it's, I, oh, go, I'm sorry, keep going. Yeah. So, uh, you know, if you, if you take the, you know, the A and not A, right, you're saying A, not A. Right? Right, what, what, if you try to put yourself in the psychological moment, right, what, What's going on in your mind? And I don't think anything meaningful except um, sounds, right, is is going on in one's mind at that point. Okay, I completely agree with that. I think that's an excellent way of putting it. Um, but if we take that example, though, and we say, let's, can we conclude then that in the most extreme bald case of A and not A, then we can turn around and say it must be reflective of a a lack of thinking or maybe a lack of intellect or there's a there's a lack of something in a literal sense it's a lack of cognition but if Mm. there's a thinker or a writer that is writing in a way in which their cognition dissolves can't we say well that's obviously not a very deep thinker in fact that might not even be a thinker at all i think you'd have to look at how that person right got to that conclusion um people can get there shallowly they can have a belief system that they've committed to for kind of not very intellectual reasons, right? They give some emotional satisfaction, or they were just, you know, raised in that tradition, uh, and so accepted a number of beliefs. And then when they start to think about it fairly quickly, realize there are some contradictions there. But uh, because of the person's, uh, you know, emotional commitment, or uh, laziness, doesn't want to have to change their minds or do any further thinking, 
is willing to say, yeah, I, I just accept those contradictions, fine. Mm. And that's just a way of, of waving off the problem. If by contrast, and this would be at the other end of the spectrum, uh, and at least I think some of the thinkers who feed into postmodernism, um, they can be very seriously engaged with trying to understand how the world works, how the human mind works, but to run into what I would call errors, in some cases, understandable errors right along the way. And as a result of that, right, come to think that, okay, I guess um, contradiction has to be accepted. So let's, you know, try some examples. I mean, mm -hmm. suppose you think of cognition, right, in general, and you start to think about it and say, all right, what goes into cognition? And we say, well, there's sense perception, uh, there's memory, there's uh, the formation of abstract concepts, there's the integrating of uh, concepts into propositions, and propositions then can be uh, of some right, complexity as well, and there are issues of syntax and semantics that we get into. Then we get into issues of uh, uh, you know, translations right across different languages and how different languages might be carving the world up at different places. There's the issue of uh, uh, how we take a number of propositions and integrate them into uh, theories. Uh, and then there's the whole issue of how we take our theories and in sophisticated ways using mathematical tools, statistics, and uh, uh, complicated logical structures where we try to evaluate those theories. There's the whole realm of uh, a fictional narrative where we take proposition and integrate those into stories and mm -hmm. stories, as we know, can be uh, uh, increasingly complex. And so uh, you're, you're trying to figure out all of this, right? Or you have some area of specialty, philosophy of language or scientific method or sense perception. And uh, as we know, right, it's very easy to get uh, a theory wrong there. Uh, uh, to encounter various kinds of skeptical arguments that uh, can be, uh, you know, initially well intended. You know, here's a real problem. How do we handle this phenomena? And if one is logical and ruthlessly consistent, right, but buys into one of the skeptical arguments, then you can, of course, run into a contradiction. And I would say that person, right, who says, okay, um, I don't know, to take a sense perception example, take the uh, cases of, you know, the relativity of perception, right? I look at something and I report that it's X and you look at something and you report that it's Y, right? Or that in some way, right, it's not X. And uh, then we come to the conclusion, well, therefore, perception is right, subjective. Mm -hmm. And uh, if uh, perception is subjective, but our abstract concepts are based on our perceptions, then conception itself right, comes to be right, subjective. And so we're not then in a position of saying, you know, if you're saying that it's A and I'm saying that it's not A, that there's any way that we can uh, decide who's right and who's wrong. Maybe mm -hmm. we just have to say it's A for you and it's not, uh, actually it was A for me and not A for you. You can see, right, someone um, studying the arguments and studying the phenomena and coming to that right conclusion. And that's not a shallow person. That's not a person who's uh, motivated by emotionalism or, or a kind of laziness. Instead, this is a, you know, a smart, literate, hardworking person who has incorporated some errors that have led to a, uh, a, uh, a conclusion that takes some sort of contradiction as built into uh, our, our circumstance. Well, I think there's that in that circumstance that we can make sense of those claims without logical contradiction. So it seems like sure. to me, I, I sure. would, I've been called both the kind of like a, a dogmatic uh, foundationalist, but I've also been called a radical skeptic um, mm -hmm. in terms of my metaphysic. I do have a radically skeptical perspective throughout my philosophy, but especially in metaphysics, where I'm not sure of the existence, I'm not certain of the existence of things outside of my mind. I have a positive mm -hmm. belief that they exist, but I am very much persuaded by s similar skeptical arguments that you've mentioned. But there's a, there's a very bright line between 
propositions about sense perception and the reliability of sense perception and the existence of actual logical contradiction in the world. So, right. so it, it, the, uh, the point of the, the analysis I'm making, right, I'm not talking about your views right in particular, but if you have someone whose uh, views are different from yours, who says there's not a bright line between where we get our logic from and where we get our sense perception from, that our logic uh, needs to be based on our perceptual awareness of the world, right, that person right, would then come to believe uh, that uh, his analysis of sense perception gives rise to contradiction. But I w couldn't we also say that person also demonstrates that they haven't meditated very deeply on the nature of logic and why it's prior to sense perception? Well, what we would need to do is then you know, look at that person. Right? How many articles did he or she <laughs> read, right? Uh, and, and, and you'd have to do a, a personal right, biographical study. But I don't think ahead of time or in any a priori way that you can say Right, here's a position who reaches uh, uh, a conclusion that includes some comfort with logical contradiction and say, oh, that person just hasn't done his homework. Well, what about something like the existence of, of Santa Claus? If somebody mm -hmm. has on their own, they've read books, maybe they're very articulate and they've concluded, yeah, you know, I believe in Santa Claus. Wouldn't you say, okay, well, that person demonstrates by the, the, the uh, elementary error in their belief system that they maybe they've thought a lot about it, but they're not deep thinkers. They're not they're not clear thinkers. Right. Yeah, I would agree with that. Because you know, something like Santa Claus, that's you know, something you should be able to figure out by age ten, right, or so. <laughs> I won't tell you that for me it was it was later than that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well again, yeah, we have to bring in the developmental psychology. <laughs> But you're making yep. an exception. So you would say there's more, there is more reasonable to believe in the existence of actual logical contradictions like A and not A than it is to believe in the existence of Santa Claus. Uh, I think it is possible for right, reasonable people to reason themselves into unreasonable positions. And then conclude their positive... Like all the but, but it's but it, everybody can do that, and that's part of the nature of of learning about the inconsistency in your own beliefs, and then changing your beliefs because you've discovered them to be inconsistent. But to discover yeah. an inconsistency in your beliefs and say, "Oh well, I I'm not going to change that. I've discovered a logical inconsistency, and that just must be the way it is," strikes me as somebody discovering that you know, Santa, that actually their parents are going down in the morning and placing the gifts there and going, okay, well, I still believe in Santa Claus anyway. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right. So in that case, you've got direct right, empirical evidence available to you. And if at that point you want to resist the direct empirical evidence and go with a continued belief in Santa Claus because it gives you emotional comfort uh, or fulfills the kind of fantasy that you have, right? That person is acting irrationally. Um, yeah, I, I grant you that, but I think that is, uh, many degrees of difference from right, a person who does a sophisticated study of cognition and reaches some skeptical conclusions there and then uh, decides that because he or she has tried really hard to resolve the problems that, uh, they are unsolvable and you just have to live with contradiction at some point. And to live with contradiction, that can mean a lot of different things. Let's try another, um, uh, another example. Um, uh, suppose, I don't know, suppose we start not from an, kind of a, an, an empiricist approach where we say we observe the world right, with sense perception and on the basis of our sense perception, we uh, derive concepts. And then as we increasingly become abstract with our concepts. We are formulating uh, logical uh, concepts and logical principles. But because I've got a, uh, kind of a relativistic or subjectivistic view of sense perception, I see that as infecting, so to speak, the whole chain, right, all the way up. So if there are inconsistencies and tensions and perhaps contradictions in how we sense perceive the world, that those are going to infect um, whatever 
abstractions, including logical abstractions that are, are based on that. Suppose instead we try to uh, go at logic right from the rationalist right perspective, and we say, no, no, logic is not based on uh, an empirical right awareness of the world. Instead, logic is something pure, or perhaps logic is something a priori that uh, may be built into the structure of the mind, right, are certain right, inflexible ways of categorizing the world, and logic is, uh, is, is that way. And so in an a priori way, right, completely independently of um, any empirical input, there are certain formal abstract principles that we right, must believe. Okay. Uh, okay, so then at that point you say, okay, I'm committed to logic. Um, and I love the, the beauty and the elegance and the power, right, of logic. Uh, and I think it's inappropriate, right, on emotionalist grounds to, uh, to let uh, logical contradictions, right, or, 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 or an awareness of some sort of tension in one's thinking uh, just be ignored because you don't want to attend to it. So suppose you uh, take that approach to logic, right? You are, you know, broadly platonic or broadly uh, pushing it further back, Parmenidean, or coming uh, uh, in, into contemporary times, more Kantian or G. H. Hardy-like, right? In one's one's thinking about logic and uh, and so forth. Now, at that point, um, all you've got is a subjective right, belief that psychologically, this pure system of uh, logic. Right, is something that we have to think in terms of. Uh, but what we don't yet have is any connection between that and reality, right? that and the world. And so at that point, we don't have any grounds right, for thinking that the way that we must think, if we are thinking, uh, matches or maps onto the way reality independent of our minds is. And that then is to say we don't have yet any grounds for thinking that logic is connected to truth, right, in any way. If we think of truth as some sort of mapping between what's going on in our minds and an external reality. Now, at that point, right, if you start probing right, that right, set of connections, okay, how can I make a connection, right, between this abstract, right, set of principles that are internally consistent inside my mind and my corresponding belief that when I am thinking, I should avoid contradiction. How can I uh, establish that that uh, means I can believe that reality independent of my mind is non-contradictory? And that's a very hard project. And I think most, uh, this is take this back to the postmodernists that we talked about last time, Right, most right, of the uh, epistemological story after Kant is uh, reaching the conclusion that if you start in a pure a priori way, there is in fact no way to get to uh, an independent world, that one ends up trapped in a kind of subjectivity. And then it becomes merely a choice uh, whether one uh, believes that external reality uh, is in fact logical and non-contradictory, or that uh, external reality is uh, is perhaps contradictory. Uh, that's an excellent way of framing the discussion. And this is literally the point of my first book on philosophy, Square One: The Foundations of Knowledge. Mm. And the way the way that we I would answer that is to say the way you make the connection between the mind and the world, the way you recognize that the world must be logical is by understanding that logic and existence are inseparable for the following reason, that any type of existence is exactly the way that it is, which means that it must not be the way that it is not. And that's not a claim just about the contents of my mind. That's a claim about anything which meets the criteria of existing, mental, yeah. physical, abstract, all of it. That is a right, universally true claim. Uh... Right, a kind of uh, argument first enunciated by Parmenides, right, who uh, sometimes credited for being right, the founder of, of logic. 
Okay. So, right. So then you uh, build logicality, so to speak, into the concept of existence or starting from your first person psychological perspective, you unpack the concept of existence and see that it, you know, it has to have a certain kind of identity uh, uh, and that identity uh, is captured in the law of identity, which is a logical principle. And out of that, as a corollary, you get non-contradiction. Right. Uh, and all that's fine, but the standard uh, skeptical response to that then is just to say, well, all you have shown is that it's impossible for you right, to think of ex existence uh, as uh, not being logical. And you haven't yet shown that it's anything other than this is how your mind has to work. And that then the second step would be to say, uh, if you take all of the follow-up skeptical arguments seri uh, seriously, and this is kind of a, a Kantian point here, that it's in fact impossible right, for you to know that. Because for you to say that all of existence right, necessarily must be logical, you have to, so to speak, confront existence in a way independently of how you psychologically must think about existence. And that's impossible. So you're stuck with just saying that, for me, uh, I think of uh, logic and existence as inextricably bound up with each other. M but my claim would be the idea that there is some kind of existence, that that means, that word has a meaning, that it could be n n a contradictory type. So something being and not being, that mm -hmm. doesn't even make any sense. That to think otherwise isn't simply false. I'm saying it is is literally incoherent. That you cannot make sense of saying, "Oh, well, there might be some existing thing outside of your mind that doesn't exist." That doesn't make sense. If it exists, it exists. That's what right. we mean by it exists. Right. Uh, and I think there is right, something to that argument. Right? And uh, right now you're putting me in the position of defending my earlier claim, which is to say that smart people can get to uh, uh, skeptical conclusions about whether reality is contradictory or not. Not saying that I agree with this position. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and one of the ways of getting there is to say, well, if all you're doing is in this rationalistic way, starting from the subjective contents of your mind and saying, uh, uh, I can't conceive of reality any other way than in terms of these definitions that are meaningful to me. And if I start to try to conceive of reality as violating those definitions and my cognition breaks down, well, then you are getting in the position right close to uh, the postmodernists, which is to say, well, right, you know, uh, we are in a subjective position. Um, and when we start to play around with our concepts, we do get into meaninglessness. Uh, things stop having meaning, right? A blends into not A, and all of the various uh, deconstruction methods are you know, ways of playing around with this. But what does that show, right? That just then shows uh, that either I have to think in terms of being a certain way, being logical, Right. Or I have to say that uh, uh, concepts, abstract formulations ultimately are meaningless and, and uh, kind of beside the point. And from the postmodern perspective, again, not agreeing with it, right, at that point they just say, well, that's just a subjective decision. And uh, we make a different dis subjective decision. We, I think maybe... We, go yeah, ahead. go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, I think it, it comes down to the, the term subjective. That's not a way that I, would, I wouldn't I would use that term. I would say it's very much objective, objective and universal. I had a conversation at the very beginning of um, okay, the no, series. No, hang on just a second. Go ahead. Hang on just a sec. So you just introduced right, the two more concepts, right? Objective, right? Which is to say that it has a connection to right, uh, an objective reality. That's to say a reality independent, right, of my consciousness or your consciousness. And so the, the question would be how you establish right that objectivity. Well, that's I guess that's not you would, necessarily what, you need what to I do mean. Is to say, right, here are the contents of my formulation right in my mind. If we can use that uh, analogy, and here is objective reality 
and I'm comparing the two and I'm seeing that there's a match. Right? So that gap needs to be bridged. And then the universality point would also then be to say, it's not only my mind, right, that does it this way, that all minds, right, do it this way and must do it this way. And then you have the project of showing, well, how you know, right, that what goes on in the minds of other people uh, is what is going on in your mind as well in order to get the universality claim off the ground. And again, I'm not agreeing with the skeptical points, but they're mm -hmm. going to say oh, those arguments, you know, we've tried and uh, tried really hard. And by mid 20th century, we just don't think you can do it. So we're we're trapped in a kind of subjectivity in the more postmodern sense. Well, let me take, try to take a stab at it. And um, if you can keep playing devil's advocate, I'd love to know what the what the response would be to, to this. So um, it is true. So I could say something like um, Chopin is the best piano composer who ever existed. That is something okay. I'd be comfortable saying that is a subjective truth. It's true for me, but it's not necessarily true for anybody else. I'm comfortable using the label subjective truth for that. Yeah. I would use the uh, the word personal. Right? Personal uh, truth, okay. That, yeah, here we're getting into our definitions. I mean, there's a, there's a, a more neutral use of subjective, which is just to say that it involves a subject and it, we're talking about what's going on Hmm. on the subject side of the relationship. Okay. Uh, and that doesn't necessarily mean it has nothing to do with or is out of connection with objective reality. And okay. then there's a, right, a, a narrower right, use of subjective, which philosophers typically like to do, which is to say, if it's subjective, then it uh, comes only from the subject and has no connection to hmm. any sort of intrinsic or objective relation to reality. Right. So to go to, yeah, to go to your example of uh, Chopin, uh, what did you say? He's the best composer? Yeah, piano composer. Yeah. Okay, right. Now, I'm willing to say, yeah, that certainly is an arguable position. And <laughs> right, by that, I mean, as I say, that's something that you can adduce subjective evidence for and against and right, assess the, uh, the strength of it and, and reach a reasonable conclusion or not. But I wouldn't say it's, uh, it's subjective. Uh, I would say it's subjective, right? If you, know, you were new to music, and this is the narrower, right, philosophical sense, uh, and you heard a piece of Chopin, right, being played, and you say, that's, you know, just so beautiful, and that's the best piece of music I've ever heard, and therefore it's the best piece of music ever, and whoever composed this must be the best composer mm. ever, mm. right? That would be a subjective, right, conclusion in that point, because at that point, you know, even if you're new to music, that there are other composers and that your range of data is relatively literal and you're perhaps overgeneralizing given the amount of data right that's available to you. Yes. And I, I, I mean, I, I actually, I am just using that sentence to essentially state a preference. I'm saying I like Chopin the best. And I, I'm in my own worldview, I'm actually very uncomfortable with the idea of saying Chopin is the best composer. I wouldn't say things like that. I would just say, mm -hmm. well, I'm stating my preference, just like, you know, vanilla is the best flavor of ice cream. Well, that's true for some people. It's not true for other people. But, but well, let me. Well, so, well, 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 actually, I want to sure. <laughs> work on that. Sure. Uh, I would say, if in fact Chopin is your favorite composer, then he is the best composer, right, for you. Mm -hmm. And I would also say that you know, once we do our work here, that that is an objective fact in the sense that I. Stephen Hicks, right, would also recognize if I did my investigation that Chopin is the best composer in the world for Steve Patterson. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If we uh, localize the claim that's being made, and that's uh, to say that your personal preference, I mean, preferences are real, and I, uh, when I'm looking out at the world, I have to recognize that it's a fact that other people have preferences. Uh, and if I were to say, no, in fact, uh, Chopin is not Steve Patterson's best composer, then I would be wrong. I would be objectively wrong right, about that. Yes, that, that's exactly where I was going. I, I have uh, a, a turn that I do that I call the objectivity of subjectivity, where then I exactly I would do that right. and say, well, sure. I can say something like, you know, vanilla is the best flavor of ice cream. But I can also say it is the case that what exists in the world is at least one evaluation of vanilla as the best flavor of ice cream. That's something that I'm saying bridges the gap between subjective and objective, or even right, in right. even in the state where you can state preferences and the contents of your mind, you can still state them from an objective standpoint. There sure. is 
the sure. feeling uh, there is sensory experiences going on in the world is an objective claim that I seem to right. know to so, be true. Right. Yes, that's right. Human beings are a part of the world and everything that goes on inside of them, right, psychologically, and also biologically, that's part of the world, uh, including their preferences, right, for ice cream. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so the way to, to deal with that kind of uh, subjectivity is to make sure that you're formulating the proposition exactly. Mm -hmm. So it's Steve Patterson, right, who is saying, I prefer ice cream to all other. So it's a claim that is localized to you. So you end up with, uh, as an implication of that, right? I can say strawberry right? ice cream is the best ice cream in the world. But what that means is for Stephen Hicks, right? Strawberry is the best ice cream in the world. Uh, and that also is true, right? It's objectively true. And you should recognize that, right? If in fact, right, it is true. No, I think Stephen Hicks so, is objectively wrong, actually, with that one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> On, uh, but then also we, yeah, we get into lots of relativity issues because, uh, you know, on other weeks I might say, no, 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 it's, right. uh, it's, it's butter pecan. That's the best ice cream in the right. world. Then you would be more wrong with that one. Um, <laughs> but, but so, but so how in the, in the, in the devil's advocate, I know this isn't your position, but in the postmodern perspective, what we've just done, I, I like the term, the objectivity of subjectivity. That's just the way that I've been putting it. What is the response to that? Ah, uh, okay. So now I put, you're asking me to put my devil's advocate right hat back on. Yeah, I think all of those uh, right points about subjectivity, they would already have nested them within a broader framework that diverse divorces rather the uh, the subjective right from the from the objective. So uh, once you start talking about things being relative. If you're coming from a perspective that says you know, objectivity requires universality to be built into it, you know, if that's your assumption, uh, then relativity of any sort is already undermining right objectivity. So people's subjective tastes about ice cream, right, or about uh, boyfriends and girlfriends, right, or about music, right, and so forth, they've already robustly right, categorize those in a non-objective way. So this is in one sense, you know, the power of philosophy, because then it becomes an operative right, uh, premise, right, all through the thing, all through the thinking, right? Anything that is subjective is then by definition alone, not, uh, not objective. But, but all so this is the, the subjectivity thing, though, it's, it's, it's trivially wrong, though. I mean, it, it, I think it's going to be hard not to come back to the logical contradictions because if you say, well, okay, well, all of these truths are subjective, well, that itself is a contradiction that immediately smacks the, of the paradox. Everything is relative. Well, that's not a relative claim. So right off the get-go, and, and my, this is really pointed to my claim. My, my point is to say, because it's the case that those type of contradictions, I think, are inescapable, yeah. And it's the case that they're obvious that children, children would be able to say, mm, there's some, that doesn't make any sense. There's something fishy going on here. They, they would be able to sniff that out. Then, right. it, then, then unless we are going right down to the, okay, well, sometimes there are logical contradictions. Doesn't that mean this is a, this is a ridiculous. This is, of course, this is trivially, trivially wrong. Right. Right. Well, there's any number of ways that they will do it. I mean, it, one is, of course, the, the global philosophical point that we were making. If you uh, already divide subjectivity from objectivity, then the kind of analysis that you and I were just giving about musical tastes and ice cream, right, and so forth, you'd have to do a lot of work, right, to get them to the point where they're willing to say, okay, maybe there can be kind of an objective relativity. And for many people, that's already, right, mind blowing <laughs> that, 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 that relations can be, right, objective. Uh, because, you know, for, for various philosophical reasons, they've already divorced right, the subjective from the objective. But probably what they would do, you know, any clever postmodernist would say, all right, fine, let's, uh, let's say, I don't know, choose an ice cream flavor, right? Take vanilla, right? What do we, what do we mean by vanilla? And so we start talking about you know, definitions and the meanings, right, of concepts. And then they would start to say, well, you know, you travel around the world and you have vanilla ice cream or what's called vanilla ice cream in some places. And it's really quite different, right? So 
you know, what to, to take another example, you know, what New Yorkers call pizza and what Chicago people call pizza. Well, those are, you know, maybe just overlapping family resemblancy, right, kinds of concepts. And so even before we can get to, you know, is ice cream of a certain flavor the best or not, we uh, have to have an agreement about what that flavor means. And given the indeterminacy of language and the shifting, evolving nature of language, we're just not going to, to get there. So we start then using uh, you know, the skepticism about semantics uh, coming out of sometimes technical philosophy of language, then to undermine uh, the claim that you and I were making that we can then say there's such a thing as an object of relativity. But these, but these arguments are not coherent. Like the, the language arguments fail, and, and they fail on an elementary level. That the pizza example is an excellent example. It, it takes five minutes, not, it takes 35 seconds to resolve what's yeah. going on with pizza. That, 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 yeah. that, that, that yes, language is ambiguous. That doesn't imply ambiguous reality. It doesn't imply that we can't clear up what we mean by our, our terms. Right. But then they would just say, yeah, of course we can clear things up and we can remove the ambiguities, but that's going to be a subjective right, decision. So, uh, you know, if it, you know, you're a bureaucrat in Washington, D.C., and they do this all the time, right? And they're regulating the language that advertisers can use. Right? You can use the word organic this way, right? But they draw the line right where they draw the line. But there's kind of nothing in reality that said the line had to be drawn there. Right? Yes, but that's, that's how words practice. work. Uh, right. But what they're saying, the way words work is it's a subjective decision. Right? So, you know, take another example. This is used in, uh, in a slightly different context. But if you think about, say, the color spectrum, we've got our standard color spectrum. Uh, this is not a semantics issue. This is a, uh, a perception issue, although I guess it ties into uh, semantics down the road. But you look at the standard color spectrum and then you and I might agree that we should uh, at one end of the spectrum start with red and then shade, see orange and then yellow, green, rich, uh, blue, violet, and so on. Um, but then this is, I'm just borrowing from Nelson Goodman kind of example here. That's to say, you know, we're drawing a line between blue and green. And we're saying everything to say the left of this line is going to be green, everything to the right of that line is going to be blue. You know, Goodman's point was to say, well, you know, why did you not, you know, uh, shift the line a little bit to the left and a little bit to the right and call that overlap area between blue and green a different word, you know, uh, bleen. Mm -hmm. So you just blend blue and green. And that would have been fine, right? Or you could have called it uh, grew, right? Mm -hmm. uh, blending the blue and the green. So yes, we have this word blue and we have this word green and they do pick out uh, parts of the color spectrum and we remove the ambiguity right, by even perhaps very precisely right, defining uh, uh, where we're going to do so. But that's just the subjective decision because you could have uh, uh, carved up the color spectrum in different places be using different words and not be using the word blue or the word green at all. So you just get into, yeah, the semantic indeterminacy and then the more sophisticated uh, skeptical people coming out of language will then just push on to that. Well, let me just take a very quick stab at that. And, I, and I, sure. my attempt at, at taking a stab at this is to try to demonstrate, I think we can do this in 30 seconds. On the color spectrum, uh, there are all kinds of different colors. Each point in the color spectrum is individual and unique. It is whatever it is, and it will be slightly different from the position right, right next to it. If we're going to be super precise, every single tiny gradation of color would get another name. It is another type of thing. It is another, and in this case, I would say we're actually describing phenomena in our conscious mind when we're talking about colors, but regardless, whatever whatever colors are, each gradation is itself a unique uh, thing. And mm -hmm. all language is doing is just saying, okay, well, I'm me individually going to group uh, on top of the individual smaller colors, the green one, green two, green three, green four. I'm just going to call all these green. And sure. if, you, if you agree with where I've 
put up those arbitrary boundaries, then okay. we can have effective communication. Okay, then question. You, so then we have a hypothetical. Here I am again wearing my uh, devil's advocate skeptical hat. You say, if I agree, well, what if I don't agree? Or if then I say, we would you know, be, I, we'd be using language different. Okay, yeah. Okay, and what's wrong with that? If our point is to have effective communication, then... Okay, well, what we if have, I don't want to have effective communication? But then, What if then, I just want to uh, beat you up, right, or ignore you? <laughs> well, then we're not participating in any kind of rational understanding of the world. It doesn't imply the world right, so, isn't the way that it is. It just means you don't want to talk to me. Well, then we've gone in a circle, right? Because then we're saying uh, the commitment to rationality right, is, uh, is, is uh, I'm, I'm saying in the devil's advocate position, right, based on a subjective commitment. There are certain goals or values that mm -hmm. you would like to achieve, uh, but you know maybe other people don't have those goals or values. Well, then, so let me ask your devil's advocate here: um, Is the, would the person so then, be? So then, what we're saying is, right, in order to solve the problem of semantic ambiguity, right, their argument is going to be, yeah, but that uh, is already to uh, presuppose a subjective value judgment. Okay, so so would the, would the skeptic agree with this if, if I were to say? That you, we might actually have find agreement between your devil's advocate and, and my position and maybe your position. That mm -hmm. if you're willing to abandon rationality, making sense, trying to explain the world, and effectively communicating with anybody, then I grant you can refuse to communicate. I'll yes. grant that, and they and they would agree with that. You think? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> but that doesn't that. And what my then I I this is great. And then I would turn around and say. Therefore, I have you have demonstrated, this devil's advocate has demonstrated that that person is not a serious thinker because they've just abandoned rationality explicitly. Mm. Yes, and at that point, though, the question is how they got there. Right? If they got there through long theorizing uh, and uh, uh, sophisticated study, uh, as some people do, then uh, the person is yes abandoning rationality, but they're not doing it in a shallow way. You know, there is the old, the old cliche right, that um, um, right, philosophy is a self-destructive enterprise because it's so complicated and the, the more you think about it, the more you end up uh, ending up in, uh, in paradox, right? Or more questions that you uh, come to think that just can't be answered. So what we're doing then is just coming back to the initial point of the conversation is I don't agree, right, as you don't agree, right, with the people who ultimately want to abandon rationality, right, we reach a decision point where we say, ah, here's a contradiction or a tension in my theory that means something has gone wrong and I need to continue to do the hard work of trying to find out where in my 300-step you know, chain of reasoning I made a mistake, right, um, or right, do we want to say, as some people do, well, it's pointless, right? We're never going to do this. So uh, how I live my life, it's not going to be primarily by the guidance of philosophy understood as the rational, right, pursuit mm -hmm. of truth. Mm -hmm. So we see, for example, you know, someone like uh, David Hume, who uh, you, know, you, you can't call him a, a shallow person, uh, you know, who thought deeply, right, and read widely, and right, the conclusion at one of his works is to say, you know, after he's reached skeptical conclusion after skeptical conclusion, he's looked at these metaphysical issues, these value issues, these epistemological issues, is just to say, well, you know, everywhere I turn, right, philosophy leads me to a dead end. And his response is then to say, well, you know, I have got my life to live, right, essentially. I've always <laughs> goals, right, and values to live. And so uh, I'm just going to reach the conclusion that philosophy is really not a primary tool for helping me do that. Hmm. It must be that there are other things that uh, that are more important, more worth my time, other ways that I'm going to make my decisions about how to spend my time, how to make my decisions, and so on. Well, maybe uh, Hume is an excellent example, and maybe the the fundamental disagreement, maybe between you and I, uh, and I have to think more about this, is what we mean by being rational and what we mean by being a deep thinker because Hume's definitely a deep thinker but I do think it's also the case that if if there is an individual who by other criteria seems to be a deep thinker maybe a great chess player great intellect but is confused by the semantic stuff 
so confused that they turn around and think, well, maybe logical contradictions exist in the world. Then I, yeah. it is hard for me to shake the idea that, that, that they've made the Santa Claus error, that they wake up, discover that their parents are putting the kid, the gifts under the, uh, under the tree and go, oh, well, Santa Claus still exists. Yeah. I think the better way to do it would be to put yourself in the position of an intelligent undergraduate philosophy student who goes to a university and is taught by you know, 20 or so very sophisticated philosophy professors, all of whom are skeptical, right, in mm -hmm. varying degrees. Uh, my view is that that is going to be overwhelming, even to a very intelligent, you know, 20 to 22 year old. Mm -hmm. And by the time uh, he or she has got through his four years of university, has heard, you know, 60 sophisticated skeptical arguments. If the education has been one sided, then that mm -hmm. person has heard the other side of the argument. And so when, uh, you know, that person sits down to talk with you, another intelligent person who's got more uh, optimistic conclusions and beliefs about objectivity, rationality, and so on, um, you know, you might then very successfully in a one hour conversation be able to open that person's mind to say, oh, on these three issues, you know, maybe there is something to the objectivity right point. Right, or the importance of logic, right point. Mm. But still, right in that person's mind are the other 57 skeptical arguments. Mm. You haven't addressed those yet. And so the conversation uh, ends, you guys go about your merry ways, and that person then is still you know, uh, uh, then 94% you know, a skeptic, but open to the possibility of objectivity in a certain way. And I don't think that's a that's a shallow person. I think that's a that's a person right who's tried very hard. And my point only is that's a, that's a possibility, and I think it's a possibility because I you know I meet them a lot <laughs> hmm. uh, in my in my uh, my line of work. Well, that's a, a perfect note to end on. Um, this has been a, right. a, a just a fantastic conversation. Thanks again so much for sitting down right. and talking with me. My pleasure, Steve. All good stuff. All, right. All the best to you and your show. All right, that was my conversation with Dr. Stephen Hicks of Rockford University. I know you guys enjoyed it. So much more to say on this topic. It's such a hot button issue and it's so relevant and so fundamental. Questions about the existence of objective truth, objective reality and our access to it are fundamental to your worldview whether you like it or not. And more often than not, these ideas get coupled with political beliefs. If reasoning is actually ineffectual, and we can't get access to objective truth, well then politics isn't really about principles. Politics is about power, it's about group identity. Not surprisingly, I think this worldview has been most popular with those on the left. It also immediately affects your position on social issues. Another hot topic is the transgenderism debate and your perspective on the fundamentals of philosophy about objective truth, identity, and how we know it is going to affect how you answer the question, what is the metaphysical status of a transgender person? Is it their biology? Is it their mindset? Is it how they self-identify? Can they identify themselves in a way that they aren't? Can you be wrong about your self-identity? All of these are, as far as I can tell, pure philosophy. But that's enough for me for now. Lots more to say on the issue. I'll talk to you guys next week.